one of the articles that I get uh, periodically uh, from Olive Tree Ministries, it was talking uh, specifically about uh, the end time of events. It was talking about uh, how the world is being set up presently even for the Antichrist to come on the world scene one of these days in a one world government. And I found this very interesting. Since Sunday morning I'm going to be preaching on America. I, I want you to look at this article with me because this is really, to me, incredibly frightening. If there ever was a time, I wrote this, Christians need to pray for America, it's now. And then quoting from an article in the Los Angeles Times and Yahoo News is uh, headlined, Why America's Record Godlessness is Good News for the Nation. The article reads, The, secular, the secularization of the United States society, the waning of religious faith, Practice and affiliation is continuing at a dramatic and historically unprecedented pace. While many may consider such a development as a cause for concern, such a worry is not warranted. This increasing godlessness in America is actually a good thing to be welcomed and embraced. The article heralding America's new godlessness said that now society can embrace abortion socialized medicine, euthanasia, and gun control. It goes on to say the organic secularization we're experiencing in the United States is a progressive force for good, one that's associated with improved human rights, more protections for planet Earth, and an increased socio-cultural propensity to make this life as fair and just as we can in the here and now rather than in a heavenly reward that fewer and fewer of us believe in. And I put, can you imagine that? I never thought I'd see the day. And uh, we are certainly living in some challenging times and with liberalism on the rise, I can just see every day of my life as I read various articles and various articles about what's taking place in the world and world governments and one world government and how easy it will be for people to bow to a government and do as they say do. I can see where even during this time of pandemic with the uh, uh, with uh, the vaccination versus the non-vaccination and about 50% of Americans have taken it and about 50% haven't. And uh, there's a great draw and divide on all of this and there's so much controversy over it. But uh, it, it's easy to see how that we are moving far, uh, farther and farther away from the Word of God and that we're moving closer and closer away to a one world government one of these days whereby people will not be able to buy and sell without having the mark. And even now, some uh, places are um, firing people uh, as they did in Houston, I saw. I believe it was at Methodist Hospital where 150 of the medical staff uh, were fired for not taking the vaccine. And uh, uh, so all of these things are challenging times and challenging people during this particular period of time. But more and more, almost weekly, I read about somewhere somebody has denounced their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I say they probably never had it to begin with. But nonetheless, there are lots of professors in this world. There are lots of people that are not possessors of what they profess to have, and that's why someday Jesus will say, depart from me, I never did know you to begin with. And even though they will say, well, we healed in your name, we cast out demons in your name, we did this and we did, did that, the Bible very plainly says Jesus someday will say, depart from me, you who work iniquity. Now, for those of you that grew up, how many of you grew up in, in the 1950s or before? Now, that's probably pretty much everybody in here tonight. 50 years ago, 60 years ago, I can assure you we would not have had an article like this that's talking about how people are denouncing their faith and that uh, religion is waning and that the Bible, in fact, I didn't go ahead and write all of the things that were in the article, but uh, the article mentioned how that uh, 
people scoff at the Bible and just say it was written by a bunch of men. It's just some history and a lot of fables and false stories that are in there. Folks, let me tell you tonight, if you lose sight of the Word of God, you've lost all hope. If, 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 if you have no hope in Jesus Christ, who is the resurrection and the life, then you have no hope whatsoever. And all of the so-called liberals that we have in the world today that are trying to lead people astray, I can assure you, according to the Bible, there is a payday someday, as R.G. Lee said uh, many years ago. Well, with that in mind, and I'm going to be quoting that from Sunday, what I just put on the, that uh, newsletter for tonight. I want to pick up it with the book of Job tonight and um, see how far we get with what we're speaking about. If you will remember last uh, Sunday evening, I have to think, is this Wednesday night? Is this Sunday night? Seems like everything runs together. I've dealt with so many different families this week that, uh, and then hospitals that sometimes I have to remember when I wake up, a mo I woke up the other morning and thought it was Sunday morning. I think it was Thursday. So uh, I don't know if you occasionally get like that, but occasionally, uh, you know, I, I'm so busy in my mind with everything that I've got to remember and all of the various things that sometimes it's hard to remember. I, am I going to preach this morning or am I going to hospitals and visit with families and those type of things? But last Sunday evening, I specifically rem remember mentioning the mystery, the mystery that was going on in Job's life. Now, it was not a mystery to you and to me in the sense that we have the Bible that we know in chapters 1 and chapters 2 which set up for us the background behind what was going on in the life of Job. But the mystery was when it came to these friends of Job's and, and they came to Job with all of their criticisms and their accusations and their supposedly well-meaning intentions that they came with to uh, bring condolences, to sympathize, to sit with Job and all of that turned into a fiasco and uh, they set up their own scenarios of what was the matter with Job and why he lost everything that he lost and of course they could not um, comprehend that there is a mystery sometimes that God does not reveal to mankind. Job's friends, they left no room for mystery. And what was in Bildad's mind was something like this. He's basically saying to Job, it's clear to us that there is some secret sin somewhere in your life. If we press the issue long enough, you will finally admit it. That's basically what they were saying to Job. You know, when you, when you come to these passages in the book of Job, I've asked myself over and over many times in studying the book of Job and looking at it and trying to uh, look at some of the uh, deeper things within the book of Job, looking at various biblical scholars who have written about it, uh, uh, Chuck Swindoll and many of the others, uh, I, I'm reminded that sometimes you get so bogged down in some of the very negative things that it's hard to really sometimes get beyond those things to understand some of the perspective and the focus of what we need to understand. Bildad visits Job with one reminder after another of death. Wow, that's, that's really interesting for a caring counselor he just goes in he pulls out all the stops he underscores the presence he uses death and he calls it the king of terrors in chapter 18 verse 14 you got to remember when you're reading job and studying job and looking at job all of this is in poetic fashion from chapters 3 and following uh, through many, many of those chapters. It's a poetic language. It's allegory. He gives word pictures when he's presenting what he wants to portray about Job. And uh, four of the things that, uh, that were given here in the book of Job tonight are 
uh, Bildad portrays Job's dying in four different word pictures. First of all, in chapter 18, 5 through 6, he, uh, he uh, paints this picture of a light that's going out. Indeed, the light of the wicked goes out and the flame of his fire gives no light. The light in his tent is darkened and his lamp goes out above him. Uh, so one of the things that he uses to illustrate Job dying here is a light that's going out. Secondly, he uses a person who's trapped, heading for death. And there's the implication here that Job has a scheme that he's not willing to admit. Notice in verses 7 through 10. His vigorous stride is shortened and his own scheme brings him down for he's thrown into the net by his own feet and he steps on the webbing. A snare seizes him by the heel and a trap snaps shut on him. A noose for him is hidden in the ground and a trap for him on the path. And so he uses another picture there in this poetry illustration of saying that Job here is trapped heading for death. Then thirdly, he uses another word picture uh, and he portrays Job as a fugitive that's being pursued. Now it's here that Bildad uses and introduces the term, the phrase terror of death. In Job chapter 18 verses 11 through 15, all around terrors frighten him and harry him at every step. His strength is famished and calamity is ready at his side. His skin is devoured by disease. The firstborn of death devours his limbs for he's torn from the security of his tent and they march him before the, there's the phrase, king of terrors. He's speaking there about death. There dwells in his tent nothing of his brimstone uh, brimstone is, uh, is scattered on his habitation. Now, there in verse 15, can you even imagine this friend comes to Job and he uses the term fire and brimstone. In other words, he's saying to Job, Job, because of some secret sin in your life and all the calamity that's come upon you, it's for a reason. You've done something uh, that you're not revealing to us. And uh, he's saying that judgment is coming to you. He's basically saying, Job, you're on your way to hell. And then he gives a fourth picture here of Job and dying, and he portrays Job as an uprooted tree. Notice in verse 16 through 20, his roots are dried below and his branches cut off above. Memory of him perishes from the earth, and he has no name abroad. He's driven from light into darkness and chased from the inhabited world. He has no offspring or posterity among his people, nor any survivor where he sojourned. Surely such are the dwellings of the wicked, he says, and this is the place of him who does not know God. Now, Bildad ends this speech here with this ultimate insult. He says, you do not even know God. Can you imagine? I don't know about you, but I would have sent that bunch packing. Let me tell you what, I would have told them to get out and don't come back. And uh, don't look so pious. I think some of you would have done the same thing. Uh, Job's friends certainly were not the kind of friends most people would savor or most people would want. And so Job uh, is totally insulted by Bildad telling him that he doesn't even know God. And, of course, Job, if you can see him in the ash heap, he's covered in sores, fever's intensified, his head is shaved, he's dirty, he's hot, he's enduring pain at the most excruciating level that anyone could experience pain. And standing over him is this, uh, the stupidity of this friend Bildad with the audacity to dress Job down and conclude that he doesn't even know God. Now, why, why that? Why would God include this scene in the Bible? Why would God put this in here? You've got to remember, folks, that the book of Job, some biblical scholars say it's the oldest book in all of the 66 books of the Bible. Others say it's at least as old as the book of Genesis. 
So why would we have all of this? I think one of the answers, among many, is because the spirit of Bildad still lives in the world today. The spirit of Bildad still lives. There are times that it will surface in the form of a harsh, judgmental, marital partner who no matter what cannot offer a word of encouragement or affirmation to another spouse. At other times, this Bildad spirit emerges in the form of a boss who criticizes an employee incessantly. Sometimes it's displayed by a preacher who uses the pulpit to hammer and to beat down the sheep. Or it may appear in the response of a harsh and an impatient nurse who will be glad when you're gone so she can get you out of the hospital room and the hospital room cleaned up and get somebody else in there. I don't know about you, but in my position, I get to hear all kinds of stories, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And a lot of those stories, truthfully, I wish I'd never heard because it sort of taints my view of the future. But you can count on it that the spirit of Bildad is still living today. Just like the spirit of, of Balaamism that we looked at in the Sunday school last, lesson last week or two Sundays ago. There were two major mistakes that Bildad, this friend, makes. Number one, first of all, he's talking to the wrong person. He's talking to the wrong person. Some of the cruelest things I've ever seen in my ministry in dealing with people uh, who are going through all kinds of problems in their life, whatever they may be, is that, that there are a lot of counselors out there. And I'm speaking, I'm not talking necessarily professional counselors, even though that could apply. But there are lots of people out there in the world who love to be a counselor to somebody and uh, they really, really come up with the wrong things. And it's the wrong things that people remember most. They remember the wrong things that are done and said. And, and um, so Bildad makes the mistake. He's speaking to the wrong person. Job is not the audience by which this guy ought to be speaking to. And the second mistake this so-called alleged friend made, he's speaking with the wrong motive in mind. Bildad says things about death, about being haunted by the king of terrors, that's he's speaking about death, and being dread, uh, driven to this dreadful state of mind, all of which are true, if a person doesn't know the Lord... If he's speaking to an unbeliever, then Bildad is right about the terror of death because that's a scary thing if you don't know where you're headed in life. In fact, Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12 says, there's a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. And this is what the person who does not know God has to face. Let me tell you, when I read this article tonight that I put there on the front cover of your Wednesday night bulletin. Let me tell you, there's a lot of people out there in the world tonight that have a lot to fear. I can assure you, I mentioned Sunday morning, I listened to two atheists talk on television the other night. They were celebrating their atheistic ideas. They were celebrating that they were atheists and just bragging back and forth. And I just sat there and I thought, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God, there is the payday. Someday you will stand before the great I am. You will stand before God Almighty. You will bow your knee. You will bend your knee and you will bow to the King of kings and to the Lord of lords one of these days. And this is what the person that doesn't know God has to face. But in this case, this friend Bildad had no right to say to a fellow believer what he said for sure Job knew the Lord there was no question in Job's mind Job knew the Lord Bildad 
was speaking to the wrong person, the wrong audience, and as we've seen, he had the wrong motive behind him. Job gives a, a strong response. Notice how Job will respond when you look at chapter 19, verse 1 through 3. Then Job responded, How long will you torment me and crush me with words? These ten times you've insulted me, you're not ashamed to wrong me. Wouldn't you think that if you responded that way to a friend, wouldn't you think they'd get the hint? I mean, my goodness gracious, Job didn't, you know, you would think, what else do I need to take the hammer and hit you on the head in order for you to get what I'm trying to say? Notice those verses, the word torment and crush and insult and wrong. If the reproof comes from the right person and given with the right motivation, then we're wise to accept the counsel and to be grateful for it if it can be trustworthy. Solomon said in Proverbs 27, verse 6, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of of an enemy. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Has anybody ever just said to you, told you the truth about something that you really didn't want to hear? That ever happened to anybody but me? Well, faithful, Solomon said a long time ago, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. You see, a real true friend, I think, in love will try to get you on the right track, will try to help you through these times. And that's why growing up in the right kind of home can be beneficial. Good moms and trustworthy dads, uh, they really try to reprove their children. They try to really teach them. And some of the best and the most helpful reproofs many of us ever got, I'm sure, was from either a mom or and a dad or both who corrected us when they saw we needed to be corrected. Let me tell you, it doesn't take you long to pick up the newspaper and to read all over the world where kids are being abused, kids are being sex trafficked, kids have um, uh, wound up growing up and, and got into the scene of the drugs or, or some kind of violence or stealing and they wind up in prisons. And whenever you go and you see many of those situations, it's because they've been, uh, they've been without uh, the presence of a father or maybe a mother that's trying to raise them and she's going out working two or three jobs and doesn't have the time to spend with the kids the way they did. How many of you, when you were growing up, went to school, uh, and if you got a whipping at school, you could get uh, the wrath of your parents when you got home? Any of that ever happened? Yeah, what happened? Where did that go? I'll tell you where it went. It's gone with the wind. Let me tell you, I hear school teachers talk today. I, I taught during the day, thank God, I taught during the day where there was the respect of parents. I had many parents that would come to school and say to me, let me tell you, if so-and-so doesn't do what you tell him or her to do, all you have to do is pick up the phone, I'll be up here, and I will give them a whipping right in front of you, and you can whip them too. Now, those days are long behind us because we found out, oh, that it hurts, it hurts their personality. It hurts who they are. It hurts who they're going to become. Well, I want you to know my dad never did have to whip me very many times, but I can assure you the times that he did, I remember every one of them because I would beg for mercy. And I would fall down into a fit of screaming and bawling, but I can assure you it didn't help. I still got the uh, spanking, and I, I tried not to do that again, although I'm probably did and maybe at times got away with it but let me tell you the, t the tongue of the wise person can be very beneficial whenever we really do the right things I hear people say all the time over and over and over that they'll be in a restaurant they'll be in a line somewhere at the grocery store or wherever it may be and a child is acting up and acting out and the parents just let them do it well folks that's what's the matter that's what's the matter today. I'm sorry, but truth is truth, and the truth hurts. And when kids are not disciplined and taught how to act, 
Nobody wants to be around that. And so, uh, but let me say this, like Bildad, the tongue, on the other hand, can certainly be a deadly thing. It can torment, it can crush, it can be insulting, it can hurt. When David wrote the 57th Psalm and was fleeing from his arch enemy Saul, he was a fugitive for about 12 years, and it's in that context that he records some descriptive expressions regarding the destructive power of the tongue. In Psalm 57, for my soul is among lions. I'm a slaw among those who breathe forth fire. Even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows and their tongue is a sharp sword. Let me tell you what David is describing there. He's describing abusive speech, assaulting people with our tongues. And David understood that. David had been a recipient of that. Notice in the 64th Psalm, verses 1 through 4, Hear my voice, O God, in my complaint. Preserve my life from dread of the enemy. Hide me from the secret counsel of evildoers, from the tumult of those who do iniquity, who have sharpened their tongue like a sword. They aim bitter speech as their error to shoot from concealment at the blameless. Suddenly they shoot at him and do not fear. Let me tell you, the tongue, life and death, the Bible says, are in the power of the tongue. And so the tongue is a powerful weapon. In fact, Proverbs chapter 12, 18 says, there's one who speaks rashly like the thrust of a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Proverbs 15, 4, a soothing tongue is a tree of life but perversion in it crushes the spirit. And this person, Bildad, he blamed Job because he believed everything that was happening in Job's life was because Job had some hidden sin. Therefore, he erroneously concludes what he was going through was the appropriate consequence that was prompted by Job's wrong. And Job realized that there was no sin that he hadn't confessed, so he saw what he was going through as a mystery. Let me tell you tonight, if you're going through something, you don't have the answers, it, it will be a mystery. It will be a mystery all the days of your life. There are things in my own life that are mysteries that I deal with, that I go through, that I don't understand. I just know the real, and when you add mystery to the silence of God and a feeling of distance from the presence of God, life becomes borderline unbearable. Jana sang that song a few moments ago, and I love the words to that song, in and out of situations that, that trouble me. All day long I struggle for answers that I need, but when I come into his presence, all my questions become clear. We may not have the answer to the questions, but we know that God has a purpose. God has a plan. God knows everything from beginning to end. And Job's periodic losses in this life, he does not understand, will not understand. He may never understand because we sing that old song, by and by, when the morning comes, when the saints of God are gathered home, we will tell the story of how we've overcome. We'll understand it better by and by. And yet, I read in the Bible that the former things will be remembered no more. When you and I get into the presence of an almighty God that created an incredible, unbelievable world that scientists will never ever in this lifetime be able to plumb and to understand and to think that God is going to create a new heaven and a new earth one of these days. The Bible says wherein dwells righteousness. Let me tell you, if we did not have that hope tonight, this church would be empty. There would be no building on the premises of these grounds. Let me tell you, I keep trusting, I keep believing because I realize without the inspired word of God, which 
liberalism and university, many in the field of education out there in the university worlds that are teaching that all of this is hocus pocus aliocus, all of this kind of stuff. Is it any wonder that young impressionable minds that really know nothing about the Bible, and I find this so often when I'm dealing with people about services and memorial tributes and, you know, what scripture do you want? Pastor, just select those. You know, I mean, and that's great. I love to select them because I think I know what speaks to the heart. But let me tell you, the world that is turning its back on God and country, in fact, in that article that I read for you tonight, there on the front of the cover of your Wednesday night bulletin, in that same article, it spoke about one of the representatives who's a big-time name in our government, said there was no place in Congress for God. And he something to that effect. And when I read that, I thought, buddy, I don't know if you know Jesus or not, but I do know you will give an account of that one of these days before the great I am. You see, a soothing tongue is a tree of life, but perversion in it crushes the spirit. And Bildad blamed Job because he considered him a sinful man and therefore he erroneously concluded what he was going through and that it was appropriate for him because obviously Job did something that Job should not have done and so they concluded Job you are the guy that's the problem 